mortality rate was lower than ever before. Ration books were being distributed very efficiently by the local food offices. It could take as little as 15 seconds for a new ration book to be issued. On the whole, he wished to maintain existing rations for the remainder of the year, but there were a few changes. Milk is to be reduced from four pints to three per week. The cheese ration, however, will be raised from two ounces to three ounces per week. An extra pound of sugar per person per week will be issued for jam making. Carrots must not be sold at more than six pence a pound, and it was hoped that the price would go down to fourpence halfpenny. The price of bread would be maintained, but it was never to exceed ninepence for a four pound loaf. Dehydration, Colonel Llewellyn said, was a horrid word, and this was greeted with cheers, but a wonderful process. Now there is an entirely new product on the market, mashed potato powder. Winding up, the minister congratulated housewives on their ingenuity. But beware, he said, spam was spam, even though restaurants might call it jambon de Strasbourg au endive. Later in the debate, the Conservative member for Aberdeen, Mr Robert Boothby, took issue about the quality of bread. He said that the two great pleasures he looked forward to on the day the war ended was first to pull up all the blackout blinds and for the lights to shine out at night, and second that the government will no longer be in a position to force filthy brown bread down the throats of the people of this country against their will. The Home Secretary, Mr Herbert Morrison, has disclosed that so far the war has cost the United Kingdom some £19,000 million. Speaking in Norwich, Mr Morrison said the government had spent more than twice the amount expended on the First World War. The weather in the Channel is worsening tonight with low cloud, mist and rain, though sea conditions are said to be moderating. Supreme Allied Headquarters has said that the landing of supplies is continuing despite the unfavourable conditions. Reinforcements are going ashore and tonight large numbers of Royal Air Force bombers are once again heading for France as the battle along the Normandy beachhead reaches a critical phase. That was the news tonight, the 9th of June, 1944. From the BBC, good night. Film director George Stevens' remarkable colour film record of the Second World War, starting on the beaches of Normandy and ending in Berlin in the summer of 45, starts on BBC Two in a couple of minutes. OK, boys. Rock and roll! Offshore, off limits, but there are rules. Get the key! They may be your friend. They may be your enemy. They may save your life. Roughnecks won't let you down begins next Thursday at 9.30 on BBC One. David Hunt, David Blunkett, Shirley Williams and Professor Colin Blakemore are David Dimbleby's Question Time panel in 45 minutes. Now on BBC One, Nick Ross and Sue Cook with Crime Watch UK. Good evening. Our 100th programme last night resulted in three arrests and there's a new lead in one of our incident desk cases. We hope to be able to bring you a great deal more on that in our next programme. On the murder of Larry Burt on a day trip to London, it's been confirmed that he sometimes visited gay pubs and clubs in the capital and there are now new lines of inquiry. On the murder of Wendy Speaks, a viewer called in about an experience which may be related to the crime and several names still have to be checked out. Detectives now say they are very optimistic of a result. Our first reconstruction tonight takes place in Birmingham. Rosella Middleton, known to all her friends as Rossi, was a lively 83-year-old woman, determined to live a full and active life. Quite recently, she was mugged, but she remained as resolutely independent as ever. Seven weeks ago, she was murdered. No one knows why. And her local community is devastated. Last Sunday, our sister Rossi worshipped with us here in church. This Sunday, we must do the same 
but without her. I can hardly express what I feel. Her death has shocked and stunned us, and many in this community. Seven and five, 75. Five and two, 52. Oh, yes. Oh. Goodness, well. Rossi was born and bred in Birmingham. Her husband died 20 years ago, but her son Brian and daughter Janet kept in close contact, and Rossi doted on her five grandchildren. Can I say a word about next week? No lunch club next week, but in three weeks' time, it's the outing for the pub lunch to Broughton on the Water. Rossi spent a lot of her time travelling around on the bus network. Good night. Oh, I meant to give you these, Chris. Thank you very much. I'm going to do you go now. Safe journey home. Yes, thank you. Good night. She thrived on getting out and about and meeting people. I was coming from Bingo, and I walked up the high street to catch my bus. I'm a bit nervous of waiting at bus stops for the buses, so I stood in Burton's shop doorway. Right. No spring about no, it, not sure. It's always all. cold when you wait. waiting for a bus, isn't yeah. it? The man and the woman was having a good conversation, and they seemed to be very good friends. The following day, Joy saw Rossi with the man again. This time, she paid for his bus fare. Mum's independence was very important to her. We implored her to, uh, to be careful as to the time she went out, but it was practically impossible to, to stop her. You know, she just valued her independence. Mum, where'd you put the sugar? It's in the cupboard on the right. It's Wednesday, April the 20th. That afternoon, Brian Middleton dropped in at his mother's for tea. Here we are. Ooh. That looks lovely. Mm. This was the last time Brian saw his mother alive. During the course of that evening, Rossi was picked up several times on the city's security camera network. Twenty-six, please. Mrs. Middleton came into the shop most evenings, and I've known her for about fourteen months. She was a lovely lady. Always had a laugh and a joke with us. She always used to ask us how we all were. Hello, Mrs. Middleton. All right. Yes, thanks. That's good. You're not going to eat all that yourself. Oh, I am. I'm going to sit in front of the television and eat every bit. That's one pound twenty. Then could you get the money out for me? How's the grandchildren? All right. Ain't they fine? You know, great grandmother now. Are you really? Yes, I'm going to bring you some photographs tomorrow. Yes, put your change okay. in the purse. Good night. Take care. Yes. See you tomorrow. Hello. Same time, same place. Yes. I've missed my bus. Have you really? Yeah, and Thomas should be here. I can't understand it. I understood right. Thomas was the man who was with us the two previous evenings. I wonder if you'd mind waiting with me. Sure, no problem. I think this is my bus now. Thanks okay, for waiting with okay. me. Okay, good night. This woman, Cathy, often caught the same bus as Rossi, and they'd sit together and chat. Tonight, though, she hadn't noticed her. It wasn't until afterwards, as she stood up to get off the bus at Birchfield Tower, and she spoke to the driver, that I realised it was Rossi. Cathy had sometimes seen a man in his 50s meeting Rossi off the bus, but tonight there was no one there and Rossi walked off alone. Her flat was just a few steps away. 
Rossi's body was found there the following morning. We can't help feeling anger at the way Rossi died. She was so regularly here with us. We can hardly believe that it's true that we shan't see her again in her usual place. Mr. Ross, why would anyone want to kill Rossi? Well, we don't know. We don't know the motive of the, of the murder. It could be theft and burglary, or it could be a sexual attack. We know that she was sexually assaulted. It may have been that her attacker followed her into her flat, or it may be that she allowed somebody in the flat who she knew. So nothing was missing from her flat, but somebody no. did leave a scarf behind. Yes, we found this scarf in, in the flat that doesn't definitely belong, uh, does not belong to, to Rossi. Uh, I'm anxious to hear from anyone who knows anybody who's lost a scarf like this. Or somebody might remember that somebody hasn't got it anymore. That's right. Let's have a look at the man she referred to as Thomas. Rossi was seen talking to a middle-aged man on several occasions. Yes. Are you happy that all those sightings are of the same man? Yes, I'm sure it's the same man. I'm sure that the man is local to Birmingham, perhaps to Perrybar or Birchfield in particular. What does he look like? He's uh, 56 to 60 years of age. He's below uh, average height. He's broad and he's got a, a bit of a beer belly. Uh, and on both occasions that he's been seen with Rossi, he's been wearing a navy blue Mac. He's quite likely to be a friend of Rossi's, of course, but unless he comes forward, suspicion is more likely to fall on him. Of course, and we want that man to come forward. He needs to be eliminated. He does indeed. What sort of person do you feel you're looking for here? Uh, I think that we're looking for a, a local man, uh, again local, perhaps to Perry Bar and Birchfield area of Birmingham. Uh, clearly a very dangerous man. Uh, the circumstances of this offence are so serious that it's upset a lot of my detectives, uh, seasoned detectives on the team. This man is very dangerous and must be caught. Well, Mr Ross, thank you. There's a substantial reward as well. The number here for anyone who can help with any information at all is 0500 600 600. The direct line to the incident room in Birmingham is 021 626 6119. That's 021, the code for Birmingham, 626 6119. Well, let's turn now to photo call where last month there were three arrests. Robert Hawkes, though, is uh, still wanted in connection with deceptions in the motor trade. Forty viewers gave new information and inquiries now centre on the Netherlands. Man Top Wright was arrested ten days after callers rang Crime Watch about him and he's now being questioned about a series of building society robberies. Gulta Ahmed is now thought to be abroad. Crime Watch viewers told detectives where to look. A call has also turned up some new lines of inquiry. And the couple bottom left who were wanted in connection with uh, a serious assault in, in Lancashire, well, as a result of viewers' calls, a man and a woman have been arrested and they've been charged with conspiracies to cause serious bodily harm. Let's see what happens tonight. Uh, here are Superintendent David Hatcher and Detective Constable Jackie Hames with this month's Gallery of Faces. Do you recognise this man? On Friday the 15th of April, he went into the Leeds Building Society in Worcester and threatened staff with a handgun. He escaped with a substantial amount of money. Four days earlier, he'd done the same thing at the Nationwide Building Society in Sirencester. The latest robbery happened only last Friday at the Bradford and Bingley Building Society in Bicester. On each occasion, he's carried his gun in a white plastic carrier bag. He's between 20 and 25, 5 foot 7, small build with short brown hair. If you know who he is, please ring us tonight. Next, if you shop in department stores in London, you may have been served by this man. He's Glyn Adrian Carvel, and colleagues in Leicestershire would like to speak to him about a series of frauds. Over the past two years, a number of flight tickets have been obtained fraudulently from major airlines. Glyn Adrian Carvel is 27, 6 foot of slim build with blonde hair. He sometimes uses the name Glenn Stephen Taylor. If you know where he is, please call us now. Do you know who this woman is? Colleagues in Sussex believe she may have information about a series of frauds in the southeast of England. Since February, large sums of money have been withdrawn fraudulently from bank accounts at branches in Sussex, Hampshire and Surrey. The woman is in her mid-thirties, five foot six with honey blonde hair. She often wears a black leather jacket and long black skirt. If you know who she is, please call us tonight. And finally, colleagues in Essex would like to speak to this man. Here he is in the reception of the Harlow Mill Travel Inn on Friday the 6th of May. He's armed with a handgun and lingers in the reception for a few seconds before leaping over the counter. He forced the receptionist to open the safe and escaped with cash. The robbery happened at around 10.20pm that Friday night and you may have seen him leave in a white car. He's between 25 and 30, 5 foot 8, medium to stocky build and was wearing a black baseball cap and bomber jacket. If you know who he is, or you can help with any of our photo call cases, please call us now. And there's the number 0500 600 600 if you can help, 0500 600 600. A red Peugeot 405, 
a large black plastic package, a late night walk through Lemster, a fire in Melville in Shropshire. These are all clues to a murder, and indeed they're about the only clues detectives have to go on. Trevor Bradley was described as a very ordinary bloke. No one can understand his death, except of course his killers, or perhaps there's something that you can add to make sense of the crime. All right, mate, how's it going, mate? All right, Jay. Yeah, not bad. We were fixing the roof on the old military bunker. We looked up, saw smoke rising from about a mile away. What's that over there? Yeah, There's probably some form of burning something or something. We thought that's an because usually we see a lot of fires in the country anyway and carried on doing what we were doing. We heard the uh, revving of an engine. Both looked up and a red Peugeot 45 came past the shed very fast. You hear a car like that and you see a car that speed, you didn't take notice. Basically, he was driving very dangerously. He's a bit worried, isn't he? Freak I walked up, up to it, just thinking it was joyriders, and uh, saw it was still alight um, slightly and still smouldering. Um, so I um, had a quick look and then uh, went back home to find the police. Ben Sims thought he saw a body in the back, and by late afternoon, a large investigating team had assembled in the field. The registration plates were missing, but detectives soon identified the car as registered in Ludlow. The owner, Trevor Bradley, had gone missing. I wouldn't have said Trevor had enemies, not serious enemies, no. He wasn't that sort of bloke. Just a very ordinary chap. He's coming down, what's going on? Can I stand? For someone to do that, they must have hated him. And Trevor's not the bloke to inspire hate from anybody. Trevor came from a remarkably large family. He had 21 brothers and sisters. He had problems with his legs and often limped. The charity Motability had given him a Vauxhall Nova. He sometimes bought and sold old jewellery and bric-a-brac, but he didn't have a proper job and wandered round second-hand stores, principally to pass the time and look through books. Trevor was a chap that liked to read. He'd go to charity shops and pick up books and often come down and swap books with me. He was a, a very sensitive, shy type of person, but uh, he always put a, a little bit of a, an outward-seeming personality over the top of this. He was always cracking jokes, for instance, and one thing and another. But I'm sure underneath it all, he used to be quite sensitive and he'd, he'd hurt quite easily. He was very lonely. Mm. He just needed a lot of company. Mm. He needed the company. I know he did. The one in the army was tall. He wouldn't hurt a fly. He wouldn't. At around midday on Tuesday the 26th of April, one of Trevor's neighbours noticed he had company. I was putting some rubbish in my dustbin and I looked up and I saw Trevor going up the pathway uh, with a big package. And just by the gate there was a woman uh, with a child. She had red hair, about 50, 60. If that was you, please call us straight away. You might, unknown to you, hold the key to Trevor's disappearance later on that day. At around 2.30, Trevor was some 30 miles from home in Shrewsbury Town Centre. Did you see him here? A waitress remembers that he visited the Bear Steps Cafe. He was a familiar face, because he used to come in maybe once a week, twice. Um, you get to know your regular customers. Have we got some beef left? Yes, we have. Would you like that in a sandwich? Please, and a cup of coffee. He didn't seem bothered about anything on that day, not any particularly different from any other day, really. He only stayed maybe 10, 15 minutes, and uh, he paid and left, but I didn't see which way he went. 
he almost certainly walked straight to the parade, a local shopping precinct. Tapes there show him picked up by security cameras just after three o'clock. Did you see him in the parade or recall him in the streets nearby? At 5.15, he was back near the bare steps. Since his death, it's been established that Trevor was bisexual. Did you meet him at the lavatories in Butcher Row? Trevor was a bingo fan, and by early evening, he was in Lemster, not far from his home. Did you see him in the top 10 club, or did he stay outside? If so, was he waiting here to meet someone? Two people who'd been at the bingo are the last known to have noticed Trevor as they left at 10 p.m. and drove down Broad Street. I thought he might want to lift, that he might have broken down. So we slowed the car down and he waved to us, he acknowledged he'd seen us, and we thought he was all right. What happened in the next 12 hours remains a mystery. Now, when Evans, since we finished doing that reconstruction, you've got a couple more witnesses, in fact, which place him a little further up Bridge Street, or just off Bridge Street. Yes, just after 10 p.m. on Tuesday, the 26th of April, we've got two witnesses who put Trevor standing outside the public toilets just off Bridge Street. We'd be interested to know if anyone met him there, or in fact anyone who saw him after that time, particularly in his white box on Nova in the Melville area of Shropshire where his body was discovered. Now, I take it we can assume that you will treat with the utmost discretion anybody who does come forward if they met him at the, at the lavatories and had some sort of sex liaison with him. They yes, wouldn't want even, that made known public. Even if that person is gay, I would urge them to come forward and any information they provide us with will be treated in the strictest confidence. Now, You've no idea really on motive on this. It could be a gay liaison that went wrong. Seems improbable. It could be sort of gay bashing. I know you've had one caller already a month after the murder, the death, who said that this is, was some sort of deal he'd done that had gone wrong. Now, tell me about that call, because it's quite interesting. Yes, exactly one month after Trevor's death, an anonymous call was received at the incident room from a person who actually named persons who were involved in causing Trevor's death. Unfortunately, we've been unable to act on that information. We need more information, and I would urge that caller to call us again. What, for specific questions that you've got to put, or, or just general ones? I feel he has more information he can provide, and I'm sure every, he'll have the answers. And we'll want to give them? I would hope so. OK, now, just let's make it clear. There was a very strong appeal implicit in that film about that red car we saw at the beginning, the Peugeot 405. You don't know that that was connected with the death, of course. No, but we need to trace the occupants of that vehicle to eliminate them from the inquiry. That was the morning of Wednesday the 27th of April. That's right, and that very same morning we've got sightings of a dark blue Ford Sierra in the Melville area. That vehicle contained three males described as being of a rough appearance, and we also need to eliminate them from the investigation. OK, if you can help in any way, please do call. 0500 600 600. It's a free call number, 0500 600 600. You can ask to speak to a BBC researcher if you prefer. But if you know something, suspect something, or saw something, do please call. Incidentally, there's a substantial reward, uh, £5,000. The incident room at Shrewsbury Police Station is also waiting for your call, 0743 232 888. That's 0743, the code for Shrewsbury, 232 888. Well, now, you might remember in February this year, police appealed for viewers' help with their investigations into the murders of Samantha Bissett and her four-year-old daughter, Jasmine, in South London. We had an overwhelming number of calls offering information. On Friday, May the 27th, as a result not of calls to the programme, but of slow, painstaking police work, officers arrested a local man. He's been charged with the murder of both Samantha and her daughter. And now with short appeals across the country at the incident desk once again, here are Detective Constable Jackie Hames and Superintendent David Hatcher. First, we're going to play you a tape. It's a telephone conversation between a supermarket manager and a blackmailer who threatened shoppers' lives if his demands weren't met. Listen carefully and ring straight away if you recognise the voice. Hello, Indo speaking. Yes, you know who this is. Hello. Now, yes. We don't, we don't want another repetition of what happened on Wednesday night, do we? 
Well, we have a bit of, well, because, you know, you, you didn't come back to us, we, we do have a bit of a problem. Yeah, we do, want you to... do know the reason for that, and we know the reason. What you, was... you, basically got, you basically got a few hours left, Neil. Well, look, we have, a, we have a problem because the stuff went back to London. Well, you better get it back, because either, either you deliver it tomorrow, or you're going to be in There's no, trouble. I can't get hold of it before Monday, because well, it's gone back to head office. We're quite happy to do business. Tomorrow. The we tomorrow. can't do it. We can't do it. Tomorrow. We can't do it tomorrow. Mon tomorrow. Monday is the earliest we can do right, it. Right, Monday then. Because if you come back, the Monday. police are not involved, we can get the stuff done on Monday. This conversation was recorded in April at the branch of a major supermarket in Dorset. His initial demands were sent by letter. Look carefully, you might recognise the handwriting. All the letters were signed with the initial M. The supermarket was forced to respond in coded messages which were published in the local newspaper. Finally, we'll play the tape again, only this time we've taken out the store manager's voice. Yes, you know who this is. Now, we don't want another repetition of what happened on Wednesday night, do we? You do know the reason for that, and we know the reason. What you, was basically, you, basically got, you basically got a few hours left, Neil. You know? Well, you better get it back, because either, either you deliver it tomorrow, or you're going to be in serious no trouble tomorrow. Monday. Tomorrow. Mon Monday, then. If you recognise any of the clues, please call the incident room in Weymouth on 0305 223 666. That's 0305, the code for Weymouth, 223-666. Next, th on Thursday, 12th of May, this man raped a 23-year-old woman in Eastleigh, Hampshire. At around 7.45pm, as the woman was walking down a footpath which runs beside the golf course in Fleming Park, a man approached her and asked her for money. When she refused, he dragged her off the path and attacked her. May 12th was a warm summer evening and the golf course was busy. If you saw that the man that night, or you know who he is, please ring. The man is in his mid-thirties to early forties, five foot ten, of stocky build with dark brown, greasy collar-length hair. He's got a slight squint and dirty teeth. He told the woman that he was a boxer, and indeed his nose looked as if, as if it had been broken. If you can help in any way, please ring the incident room on 0703 612 291. That's 0703, the code for Eastleigh, 612 291. Now we need your help to find the killer of Michael Fry, a 44-year-old cleaner found dead in his Yeovil home. The last time Michael was seen alive was at 10.30pm on March the 29th. He was seen by a security camera as he visited a shop in Gainsborough Way. Did you see someone follow him as he cycled home? His body was discovered the next day in his house. A number of the items were miss missing from the house, including a distinctive watch like this. It's from the jeweller's garrards and was inscribed on the back with presented to M. Fry, Gardner Merchant Limited, 1989. We're also trying to identify this man so that he can be eliminated. He was seen on Michael's doorstep 11 days before the murder on March the 18th. He's in his 40s, 5 foot 6, chubby, and had a scruffy appearance. Do you recognise him? If you do, or you've seen Michael watch, there's a substantial reward. So please ring the incident room on 0935 402 109. That's 0935, the code for Yeovil, 402 109. Colleagues in Wiltshire need your help to find this man. He was responsible for an attempted rape in Salisbury Town Centre. In the early hours of Sunday, April 24th, a young woman was attacked as she walked in the grounds of the Salisbury Arts Centre in Bedwin Street. Fortunately, a witness saw the struggle taking place and ran for help. When he returned, the attacker fled in the direction of College Street. The offender is in his late 20s of Mediterranean appearance, about 5 foot 9, with a slim build and dark brown hair. He was well spoken and had a southern accent. We're also trying to find a very important witness who's about 5 foot 10 with fair hair. He walked past the victim shortly before the attack and may have seen the offender. If you recognise the attacker or can help in any way, please ring the Wiltshire Police on 0722 411 That's 0722, the code for Salisbury, 411 
Just, just going through some of the calls we've had in so far tonight, and it's been uh, fairly busy. Uh, the number, incidentally, for all our cases, 0500 600 600, 0500 600 600. A lot of people are calling the number at the moment. Bear with us if it's engaged, but there are 40 lines on that. On the uh, murder of uh, Rosella Middleton, a name's been put forward for the video, which people are quite optimistic about. Uh, it should point out that, that there was not a suspect for the murder, but uh, a potentially very important witness. Photo call in the west of England, robber, a video uh, fit, uh, a picture rather, a viewer thinks not only recognises the, the robber, but that that same man has taken part in robberies elsewhere in the country. And uh, the bank fraudster, if you remember the, the woman whose picture we showed, six people, I think now at least six, have given the same name and have given possible addresses for her. Sue. Most of us have never been confronted by someone armed with a gun, and almost certainly never will be. Perhaps as a result of seeing guns used so often in television dramas, we can tend to underestimate the effect this experience has on people in real life. But those who have had this experience will tell you that the pure terror of it is difficult to describe. And once it's happened, it's something they can never really get out of their minds. Life just isn't ever quite the same again. The morning after the Easter bank holiday, that's what happened to the staff at a pub in Kirkham, near Blackpool, in Lancashire. <laughs> Eddie Devlin has been the licensee of the Kingfisher pub since it first opened two years ago. It's Easter Monday evening, the end of a long and busy holiday weekend. In the small hours of that night, a local woman received a phone call with a message obviously not intended for her. Hello? I'll reconnect your call. Hmm? Rod. John. It's his first time. He's going in with a gun. Sorry? Hello? The next morning, Tuesday, April the 5th. Eddie's day's work began as usual at around 8 o'clock. A few minutes later, Joan Bastian, one of the pub's cleaners, was walking to work. She was about 100 yards away from the Kingfisher when she noticed a man apparently watching the pub. I was suspicious of him straight away. I mean, it was the way he looked at me. I knew he was up to no good. He was in his late 40s, early 50s, with grey hair. He had a weathered face, as so though he was used to being outdoors. <laughs> my, my heart was thumping, I was sweating. I tried to quicken my step, just wanted to get down off the path and into the pub as quickly as possible. I think there's a burglar out on the path. Why? What's he doing? I don't know. I'm just going to take a look. What are you looking at? There's some weirdo out here. Perhaps he's just waiting for a lift. Mm, maybe. Is the cellar open yet, Eddie? Yeah. Right, you. Stay where you are. I said, stand still! You two! Where is everybody? I don't know. Just tell me where everybody is. I don't is. know. What do you mean? All the hairs on the back of my neck were standing up by then. Just talk. I just thought if yes. only I could get to the kitchen door. Right. You. Get down there with the other one. I couldn't look at his face. And that was the first time that I actually um, seen this gun. Um, and I just froze. I couldn't do anything. Shut up. Stop talking. There's no need to hurt them. You can have whatever you want. Get the money, then. I remember thinking, I should I run out the back door and raise the alarm? Then I thought, well, the cleaners have been there with him. The best thing to do is give him the money, and hopefully he'll go. These two builders remember seeing the red metro car parked outside. The driver seemed to be waiting for something. It was odd that he was parked there, like that. I remember thinking, I wonder if he's going to do the pub. Once the robber had the money, A, Joan and Betty were locked in a back room. We didn't have any choice. We had to do as we were told. We were just all confused as to, uh, well, it was disbelief and shock, I think, at, that 
this as it had even happened. Makes me angry now when I think about it as to what gives these people the right to terrify people just going around doing ordinary jobs. Do they not care? Do they not have families themselves? Would they like it done to their wives, mothers? Do they not think of how it leaves people feeling? Well, the staff there at the pub are determined to come to terms with what happened and they've all been receiving counselling from victim support. If you can help, especially if you might know who that gunman is, please do call us. He's just to recap, between 45 and 50 years old, somewhere between 5 foot 9 and 6 foot tall. He has collar length grey hair and his face was described as weathered. He's quite likely to have visited the pub on occasions before the robbery. You might have seen him there. That red metro was later seen speeding along the A585 Fleetwood Road towards the M55 Blackpool to Preston motorway. Might you have seen it after that? Or perhaps you saw it in the area before the robbery? Remember, we're talking about the morning of Tuesday, April the 5th. It was the day after Easter Bank Holiday Monday. Officers investigating this case have come down from Lancashire tonight to take the calls here in the studio on 0500 600 600. Or you can reach the incident room in Preston direct, and that number is 0772 618 888. That's 0772, the code for Preston, 618 888. Audience research for Crime Watch has shown that most people need to like and identify with victims before they feel strongly that they want to help. Yet, of course, paradoxically, it's crime against lonely and vulnerable people that often leaves the fewest clues and rely most on public help. Our next case is one of them. On Thursday the 3rd of March, a woman's body was seen beside a country road near Lutterworth in Leicestershire. Whoever it was had been murdered. She'd been left in the field in the early hours of the morning. But for several days, that's about all that anyone could establish. OK, folks, well, it's over a week now since the body of our victim was found, and frankly, we're no nearer knowing who she is. Uh, despite some good local media attention, we've had no calls or suggestions even who she might be. This may indicate she comes from out of area, the problem we're having with getting any national coverage, as you're aware, is the preoccupation with the Gloucestershire incident in the nationals. Uh, to that end, we've decided to take an advert in the Sun newspaper to reach a wide audience. We're hoping that people will respond to the advert with suggestions as to her identity, uh, and it may also lead to some national TV coverage. A physique could provide a clue. Five feet one and 13 stone. A size 22 dress, but two and a half shoe. I would appeal for anybody else who, who recognises the description. I couldn't believe it was here on, on the television. I was absolutely you know, surprised. So what's her name? Her name is Tracy Turner. And what's your relationship with Tracy? My, my, my relationship with, with, with Tracy is a, a landlord and tenant relationship, but initially we did, um, we were lovers at first. Well, I had a relationship with her, shall, shall we say. Tracy Turner was 30. From childhood, she'd suffered severe hearing problems. She overcame them with a deaf aid, which looked rather like a Walkman. She drifted into prostitution, first in Sheffield, then London and three years ago, she moved to Stafford. Dear Mum, how are you? I just thought I'd drop a line to check how you are. I'm thinking of getting my hair cut. She was quite a generous girl. She didn't bear any grudges. Uh, she had to bring little gifts and write nice letters. And She'd lend anybody a last penny. Uh, I just wished I'd have been there to hold her and tell her I love her. Can you tell me when was the last time that you saw Tracy? The last time I saw Tracy Turner was on the second at two o'clock, just before I was on my way back to London. Hi. Can I have some of that? Yeah. Cup or mug? Oh, mug. Need waking up. Weather looks great out there. Makes a change. I think I go to the building society. 
Tracy would always go to the Abbey National Building Society to, uh, to draw out some money, to, with which she would use to uh, to pay a minicab to take her to Junction 13 on the M6. Do you know we've now got Tracy in Stafford Town Centre on the second? Yeah. Yeah, she visited the Abbey National in the town centre about five to three. All she knew was taken five pound out of a six pound account. And then she's seen late about half past three in the Tesco's in the town centre as well. We had quite a good picture of Tracy now. Uh, we decided to try and talk to other working prostitutes who use the motorways uh, or motorway service areas uh, and in particular try and get any to come forward that knew Tracy. I met Tracy on Knottsford Service Station when I was going to Carlisle about five years ago. And what actually took place on the motorway services? Well, we used to go in the toilets and change from our jeans into our working clothes and do our makeups, stand around talking, never discuss the customers, and we used to go around separate ways. What sort of person would you say Tracy was? Um, she was kind and generous, sometimes very stubborn. Mm -hmm. And she liked her own company. The picture that we're getting of Tracy is of a sad and somewhat lonely girl who would hitchhike great distances up and down the motorway network. Uh, this is probably as much for company as for the purpose of prostitution, although prostitution was probably a good way of making money for her. We're going to focus our inquiries on service areas up and down the motorway. We're going to be tracing drivers uh, through credit card sales, uh, also stop checking drivers uh, with uniformed officers' assistance talking to them and hopefully getting some sightings of Tracy on the night. What time was it when you first saw her? It would have been about 12.15 a.m. I was at the Hilton Park services on the southbound on the M6, uh, crossing from the garage shop to my lorry. Uh, and, I, and I noticed her then. She was walking away from the garage towards the entrance onto the motorway. She got a, what appeared to be a walkman around her neck. Did you drive off immediately? No, I sat for a bit. I had some chocolate. I had a bar of chocolate. I had my chocolate in the cab. Uh, and I could still see her then. She'd, by this time, she'd reached the slip road, more or less, and was up on the curb. As I was watching, she was, you know, appeared to be trying to get a lift. I wasn't going to stop for her, because it's, it's not my company's policy. And I, as I was pulling away to leave the, the area, uh, a red car came off of the car park slip road more or less cut me up in actual fact, went past her uh, and pulled up further along the slip road and started reversing back to her. And as I've got past it, I've looked in the window and I've seen that it's stopped by her and, and she's sort of leaning in and, and talking to the driver of it. And you're sure it was red? Yeah, definitely red. In fact, it was a red Mondeo and its driver was traced through a petrol receipt. Can I have a lift? Where are you heading for, love? London. I just refilled my car and I saw this woman. She was standing there. I think I've seen it before because I do use the services quite a lot. Well, after I left the girl, I travelled back up the slip road, back onto the motorway. So who did pick Tracy up that night? Were you at Hilton Park Service Station driving south on the M6 just after midnight that Wednesday night, the 2nd of March? By 1am, she'd gone. Dave Cox, when Tracy was found, her clothes had been removed, and of course this jacket as part of that not been recovered that's right it hasn't been recovered uh, and we'd be particularly interested to hear from anybody who finds a similar jacket particularly if it's with other ladies clothing or tracksuit su such as that uh, and Tracy's headphone and uh, amplifier device are still missing as well now there's one other clue that you've got which you haven't revealed up, up till now which is uh, forensic evidence I, I'm not sure how much you think it's going to help with the appeal, but it's sort of the last chance. Tell us about yes. it. Uh, recovered from Tracy's body were some flecks of yellow paint. Um, they were in her hair and on her back. The paint is quite distinctive. It's a here's yellow... A, here's a sample of it. A, yes, it, yellow, it, it's a there. yellow paint uh, which is used for respraying plant or agricultural machinery. Yeah. Sort of thing you see on bulldozers, JCBs... JCBs, etc. Yeah. Yeah, plant machinery. Now, it would have been, what, 9, 10, 11 years old, at least, you yes, think? Yes, it's, it's got thing. a high lead content, so it's probably not in current use. OK, so it's somebody who's got access to, to this sort of machine, this sort of vehicle. Mm. Now, there have been two other murders of prostitutes in right. a, sort of an area not all that far away. In Birmingham, the 3rd of December, Samuel 
Paul was murdered. Then there's this one, Stafford, uh, with her body left in Leicestershire. Then on the 13th of May in Sheffield, Dawn Shields. Now, I know you haven't formally linked these, but could it be somebody, just possibly, who's driving Leicester, Sheffield, Stafford, Birmingham? That's a possibility that uh, is, is obviously uh, at the forefront of our minds. Um, we would obviously appeal to anybody who, who has information on that to, to contact any of the incident rooms or, or, or come through to this programme. OK, well, here's the number if you can help in any way at all. 0500 600 600. It's a free call here to the studio, or you can call the murder inquiry room at Leicestershire Constabulary Headquarters. That's 0533 482 184. 0533 is the code for Leicester, 482 184. Well, to keep you in touch with some of the more significant calls, we've had some interesting information on the supermarket blackmail case in Dorset. Two viewers have given the same name for the voice on the tape. Um, from Photocall, officers now want to um, hear of sightings of Glyn Carvel around the London area in particular. There's a very good lead on the murder of Michael Fry, possibly, and the man Thomas from Birmingham. Some interesting calls on him, too. Don't forget the lines are open until midnight. Don't forget to join us for Crime Watch Update at 11.30. And don't forget the number, 0500 600 600. If you've been wondering whether to call with information, please, please do. It's 0500 600 600. Crime Watch takes its summer break now. We'll be back here in September. Meantime, please bear in mind tonight that we've crammed together some of the country's worst crimes that took place over several months. Watching TV is the nearest most of us will come to anything approaching them. So please have a carefree summer. Don't have nightmares. Do sleep well. Good night. Good night. Now, a summary of adjudication from the Broadcasting Complaints Commission. Andrew R. Ullman Limited, dealers in antique and modern jewellery in Hatton Garden, complained to the Broadcasting Complaints Commission about an item broadcast last October in the BBC's Crime Watch UK series. The item included a dramatised reconstruction of events in which a man first raped a woman, then stole a watch from her and tried to sell it in Hatton Garden, the centre of the jewellery trade. The sequence in Hatton Garden included a general view followed by a brief montage of five separate shop signs. This in turn was followed by a reconstructed scene inside a jeweller's shop in which the thief was shown selling the stolen watch. The most prominent name in the montage was Ullman, which, if any, would have stuck in the minds of viewers. It's hard to say how far any viewers might then have gone on wrongly to assume that the jeweller's shop shown in the reconstruction was Andrew Ullman's, and also that it was not uncommon for this shop to deal in stolen goods. To the extent that some viewers might have been so misled, however, the Commission finds some unfairness to the company. However, they see no basis for concluding that there was an unwarranted infringement of Ullman's privacy. You can get a copy of the full adjudication by writing to the Commission, which considers complaints of unfairness and infringement of privacy, and please send a stamped arrest envelope to Broadcasting Complaints Commission, P.O. Box 333, London, SW1WOBQ. <laughs> By 9pm this Sunday, tens of millions of Europe citizens will have decided who's going to represent them in the European Parliament. As the results come in and the political map of Europe is redefined, we'll be asking how the elections reflect the broader currents of political change. How will the national leaders have fared? And what will the implications be for Britain's Conservative government and its leader, John Major? Join me, David Dimbleby, Peter Snow and a host of political commentators for a Euro election special, Europe Decides, Sunday, 9.45 on BBC Two. An election special reacting to polling in the European elections as well as giving the results and analysing today's by-elections begins at 11.40 tonight. And on BBC One Now, David Nimbleby introduces tonight's panel for Question Time. <laughs>
Good evening. Welcome to Question Time, which tonight comes from Wembley. Our audience is always representing a cross-section of the British public, including tonight some voters who've managed to escape from the by-elections at Eastleigh and East London uh, to be here this evening. And they're here to question and to argue, as ever, with our panel. And our panel consists of David Hunt, Secretary of State for Employment. He was brought into politics, he says, by his vision of Britain's place in Europe. He's now said to live in dread of being offered the chairmanship of the Tory party in the next reshuffle, so much so that he assiduously avoids making chairman-like speeches. <coughs> David Blunkett, Shadow Secretary of State for Health, and this year's chairman of the Labour Party, and as such responsible for seeing that the Labour Party conducts the leadership campaign we're about to see without too much public bloodletting, if they can. It's by no means his first appearance on Question Time. It is, however, the debut for Lucy, his guide dog, who's taking the place of Offer, who has just retired. This is Lucy's first television appearance. Shirley Williams, both a baroness and an American university professor, once Labour's Secretary of State for Education and Science. She broke with them in 1981 to help found the SDP. She now works on employment matters for the Liberal Democrats. And in the confusion caused by the last minute defection of the Liberal Democratic candidate in today's by-election to Labour, she'll no doubt be able to clarify for us the difference between the two parties. <laughs> and Professor Colin Blakemore, a scientist whose work involves the functioning of the brain, the development of sight in children, a man who's outspoken in defense of the use of animals in scientific experiment. His reward as a Christmas present last year was a letter bomb from animal liberationists. He was at 32 the youngest ever Reith lecturer and continues to argue vociferously the cause of science to counter what he describes as the ignorance of its reporting in the media. Well, that's the panel. They don't know any of the questions that you're going to ask. Let's have the first one, which comes tonight from David Windsor, a recruitment consultant. Mr. Windsor. Does the last-minute defection to Labour of the Lib Dem candidate in the Newham North East by-election merely demonstrate that the two parties' policies are almost identical? Shirley Williams. No, I don't think so. Mr. Calloway's an interesting person because he said, and I quote his words, um, it has grown on me over the last few years. I can't help 